but good afternoon and thank you all sincerely for joining. Please continue eating while I just do the uh, introductions. We are absolutely delighted and honoured to have uh, former Indian Ambassador Sinha here today, whom I will introduce uh, fully in a moment or two. But before then, I just want to flag some events coming up here at the FCC. Next week we have an evening to raise a glass with some visiting artists for Art Basel. That's on Monday downstairs in the main lounge. And the next day, Tuesday, March 26th, we will have a lunch on contemporary art in Hong Kong's role with some of those artists appearing at Art Basel. So that's on Tuesday. Also Tuesday night, I want to flag a movie we are screening, Abacus, Small Enough to Jail. It's the story of a of the financial crash of 2008 and how only one bank was prosecuted, a community bank in New York's Chinatown. It's an award-winning documentary that's on Tuesday night here. And I will also flag Wednesday night, we have the former editor of The Guardian, Alan Rusbridger, speaking on the topic why journalism matters more than ever and how it has to adapt to survive. Wednesday night, Alan Rusbridger. But for today, it's great to see such a good crowd here on the veranda. As I mentioned for this topic on, can the UN Security Council survive a new Cold War? We are honoured to have speaker Mr. Dilip Sinha. He's the former India ambassador to the UN in Geneva. The backdrop to today's talk, of course, as we know, is, is that there are concerns. The world is beginning to witness something of a new Cold War. The UN Security Council survived the first Cold War. The question is, can it survive a modern equivalent in a globalised world? Mr. Sinha today will draw on his experience to highlight, in his opinion, the incapacitation of the Council by its permanent five members, who he will argue have aggressively strengthened their dominance and spheres of influence, and he feels that this has hindered the Council's ab ability to maintain international peace. Mr. Sinha was head of India's UN Affairs during its membership of the, U of the Security Council in 2011-2012. He served as India's ambassador to the UN in Geneva, where he was vice president of the UN Human Rights Council. Among other roles, he, was, he steered India's response to the crisis in Libya, on Syria and the Security Council, and to Sri Lanka in the Human Rights Council. And during his diplomatic career, Mr. Sinha headed India's relations with Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, and he served in the Prime Minister's office. He is the author of Legitimacy, Legitimacy of Power, the Permanence of Five in the Security Council. Could you all please welcome uh, Ambassador Sinha to the podium, please? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Karan, for this introduction. And uh, I must say that I'm delighted to be here on the first day of what was originally planned to be a vacation in Hong Kong. But it's turned out that the first day is an extremely hectic one. But it's, it's a great pleasure for me to be, uh, and a great honor to be invited by the FCC. Uh, when I saw the list of the speakers who have come here, I was quite intimidated. And uh, I hope that I do not disappoint. Uh, my interest in the Security Council, uh, although I have not actually worked in New York, I served in Delhi as head of the uh, UN division. Uh, but uh, when you look at the Security Council from Geneva, you get a different perspective, and that's what uh, uh, prompted me to write this book on the legitimacy of power and the permanent five and their role in the Security Council. Because one of the things that you realize in the Security Council is the, is the, is the dominance of the permanent five and the veto. Whereas uh, the UN, which is an extremely diverse and a fairly omnibus organization, uh, has various organizations, specialized agencies, which do not have uh, the benefit of the veto and yet are fairly successful organizations. Now, next year, the UN will celebrate its 75th anniversary. So it's a good time to start evaluating its performance. And one realizes that the uh, successes of the, of the United Nations have come mainly in the fields of uh, social fields, in health areas, uh, the specialized agencies which keep the wheels of globalization going. But the UN was set up as a security organization. Its primary purpose was security, which is why the preamble started off with that famous phrase to prevent, uh, uh, to save the succeeding generations from the scourge of war. And the Council of the League of the United Nations was called the Security Council. Now, the security, the, the UN has survived 75 years, which is a fairly good record. Its immediate predecessor, the League of Nations, survived for barely two decades. And a more distant cousin, the Concert of Europe in the 19th century, uh, lasted a little longer. But 
um, both these organizations, the Concert of Europe, which wasn't really an organization, but the League certainly was, both ended uh, in wars. And one hopes that the United Nations doesn't suffer that fate. But in the field of security, the United Nations has to dig deep. The Security Council in particular would have to dig deep to find its successes. The Security Council's main claims to fame today are sanctions and peacekeeping. Now, sanctions, as we all know, uh, have little impact in changing the behavior of the target countries. There are about 14 countries which have faced international uh, UN sanctions today, and uh, many of them have been facing it for a fairly long time. Uh, peacekeeping, as we all know, is, uh, is like post-operative care. The troops are sent in after peace has been restored through negotiations mostly conducted outside the Security Council. But these are the two main successes of the Security Council. So the question arises, is the Security Council important at all? Uh, after all, two major wars in the previous century, uh, during the life of the current UN, uh, the Vietnam War and the Afghanistan War, continued and waged without the Security Council losing any sleep. And currently there are two wars waging, taking place in the world, in Syria and in Yemen. And again, the Security Council stands quite helpless. Uh, but the Security Council is the only international body which has the power to use force and exercise force to enforce its decisions. No other international organization has this power. There are different dispute settlement bodies in the world, as you'd all be familiar with. There's a dispute settlement body in the WTO, World Trade Organization. There is the International Court of Justice. There is in the World Bank, the International Settlement uh, of Investment Disputes body. Then there's there are this Permanent Court of Arbitration. But none of these bodies can enforce their decisions. Uh, the WTO, for example, allows a country to enforce penal duties on the offending country. Now, that is fine for a big power, but a small power which imposes penal duties on the imports from a big power would end up hurting its own economy more. Uh, similarly, the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, if it gives a verdict, it can't be enforced. One has to go to the Security Council and get that enforced. And uh, you might recall that in 1986, the ICJ gave a verdict against the United States on a case brought to it by Nicaragua. And when Nicaragua went to the Security Council for enforcement of that uh, verdict, the United States vetoed the resolution. So uh, it came to a knot. Now, the Security Council, as we know, during the uh, Cold War, was uh, hamstrung by the veto. The Cold War had two phases. The first phase of 20 years was the phase in which the US and the Western countries dominated the Security Council. So the Soviet Union was in, uh, imposing all the vetoes. Then after 1970, the, the communist bloc and the non-aligned countries joined hands together and the US and the Western countries came in a minority. So in the second phase of the Cold War, uh, it was the US that had to exercise the veto and the Soviet Union could get resolutions adopted in case the veto was not enforced by, this, by the US. So in the first phase, uh, the Soviet Union imposed 80 vetoes. And in the second phase, from 1970 to 1991, the US info imposed 64 vetoes. Now, then the Cold War came to an end for different reasons. And with this, a new optimism started growing in the world. This was an optimism that there would be international peace based upon democracy and human rights and that the Security Council would be able to enforce its uh, uh, mandate of providing international peace and security. And the first of the instances came in 1991, when, 1990 when Iraq invaded Kuwait and the Security Council then authorized countries to take military action and Kuwait was liberated. This was a great success. But thereafter, about uh, a dozen such op operations were authorized, but they had mixed results. And uh, the interventions, which were called humanitarian interventions, often led to acrimonious differences among the permanent five members, 
and also to a great deal of disappointment among the smaller countries, what you are essentially call the third world countries, the countries of Asia and Africa, and some countries in Europe where some of these military actions were authorized. So ambitious ideas like the responsibility to protect and aggressive military interventions went beyond the security structure envisaged for the Security Council. They raised expectations for the smaller countries, but inevit inevitably led to disappointment. So uh, this phase of cooperation among the permanent five, which lasted from 1991 to 2011, in which all these military interventions were authorized, were not a very happy experience. Uh, China and Russia went along with these uh, authorizations. They did not exercise the veto. But in the process, uh, there were a lot of differences among them. And eventually, uh, Russia and China never joined any of the military operations themselves. They didn't send troops to these military operations. They tolerated them. And in 2011, when the Libya operation was authorized, the differences came to the fore. And thereafter, no further authorizations took place. So that brings us to the current phase when the Security Council went back to its Cold War era of uh, a deadlock between the among the permanent five and no further resolutions being adopted. Now, in this phase, you have 12 vetoes being imposed on resolutions in Syria. Uh, last year, there were three vetoes exercised. One was on Syria, one on Yemen, and one on Palestine by the US. The first two were by Russia. In some of these vetoes, uh, China joined Russia and some Russia was alone. So that brings us to the point where one wonders, is there a new Cold War? Has uh, the Security Council reached a point where it is behaving almost as it was in the, during the Cold War? And uh, the fact is that there are there are no rival military alliances as they were during the Cold War. Uh, and you don't have two rival economic systems in the world today. But a military rivalry is brewing and the trading system is under pressure, under strain. Uh, but then there are differences between the current phase of the new Cold War, if, if you can call it a Cold War, and the previous one. In the sense that the global economy is much more integrated and the permanent five themselves have a great deal of trade among them. And China and the US are their, each other's largest trading partners. And the West-led international economic organizations like the IMF, the World Bank, and the, uh, the WTO have all the five permanent members. So it is not that you have two different uh, systems today in the economic field. But as far as the Security Council is concerned, its phase of activism has come to an end. Now, it's very difficult to imagine that a resolution on Syria or Yemen will be adopted and that the Security Council can authorize any further military actions as it was doing in the earlier phase. So, we come now to the point, what happens now? The Security Council survived the first Cold War primarily because neither the Soviet Union nor the US was willing to walk out of it. The Soviet Union did boycott the Security Council once for about six months in 1950 on the issue of the membership of the People's Republic of China. And that was the time when the US managed to get its resolution on Korea through the Security Council. The, security, the Soviet Union realized its mistake and thereafter did not ever boycott the Security Council. Uh, so the Security Council today survives because it is able to confine itself to gentle actions like peacekeeping and sanctions. But the number of activities of the Security Council remain quite high. So uh, not as high as during the fee phase of cooperation when, for example, in 1993, uh, when the cooperation was at its peak, the Security Council adopted as many as 93 resolutions. But last year, it adopted only 54. Now, the question is, in the current phase, what is the approach of the permanent five? Now, the one issue on which the permanent five are united is that their veto should not be touched, their power should not be touched. And while there can be an increase in the permanent membership, 
the veto certainly will not be impacted which means on this issue the permanent five are together and as long as that is the case the security council will certainly survive but the question is uh, how does this impact the primary function of the security council which is to provide security essentially to the smaller powers because they are the ones who require security and protection of their rights in a globalized world uh, the inability of the security council to address their security concerns is, has made many of these countries entirely indifferent to the security council they look upon the security council as some kind of an arena where the big powers are locked in a, a, in a, in a state of confrontation as a result of which the security council has become inactive a more representative and democratic security council would clearly be a much more boisterous and a much more cumbersome body but it would certainly be a more effective forum for diffusing global tensions and this is where i come to my experience in geneva where organizations like the who and the ilo and wipo do not have the benefit of the veto being given to some powers and all powers have to negotiate with each other to get resolutions adopted to deal with problems fairly serious problems like the ones the who deals with like the ebola virus where action has to be taken uh, admittedly not of a political nature but nevertheless uh, where interests are involved of countries especially in trade for example and um, that is where the experience of the specialized agencies and their success comes in useful and handy so the risk for the, to the of the security council risk for the security council today is more of its irrelevance than its extinction but i wonder which of the two is the more serious as a consequence for the Security Council. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Sina, very much. Well, <clears throat> we will take questions, and you're welcome to um, raise your hand and ask a question as we proceed, but I might begin, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the premise, I think, of a lot of your remarks are based on the idea that we are in or headed to a new Cold War. Um, but you also make the point, of course, we are now in a much more globalised world than we were back in the original Cold War. Do you think we are legitimately heading to a Cold War that can be compared on a like-for-like -like basis, or is it going to be something uh, much, much more different than we've dealt with before, and perhaps much more complex than what we've dealt with in the past? It's certainly much more complex than we dealt with in the past. As I mentioned, the, on the economic side, you don't have two camps. You have only one camp, whether it's the WTO, the IMF, or the World Bank. Uh, all countries are members of it. Unlike in the first Cold War, when you had two different economic systems, you had the capitalist system and the communist system, the Comic-Con, you also had two rival military alliances confronting each other. You don't have that situation today. So to that extent, yes, it is, it's a different situation, different world today. But because it's a very globalized world, the points of friction are so much more as well. And the chances of things going wrong are going uh, all right are also very strong and that makes the present situation a little more complex uh, but as far as the security council is concerned there certainly is a cold war environment because it is not possible at the present moment for a resolution as i said on the two main areas where war is taking place such as syria and yemen to be adopted uh, because the the permanent five members do not agree with each other on this so the in terms of the security council the inaction the inactivity and the uh, the, the, the the stagnation of the security council is uh, is real and there the, the cold war is certainly a reality what would it take to break that inaction you mentioned on syria and yemen for example what would it take to break the cold war grip or inaction at the un security council to deal with either or of those two conflicts that's a very difficult question because, as I said, the, the, the tension arose between the, the, the east-west, shall we, shall we call it, uh, came from the phase when the Security Council was extremely active and was authorizing military, uh, military action by member states. And uh, China and, the, and Russia were not comfortable, but they went along with them. And finally, in Libya, there was a strong difference of opinion between uh, the East and the West, shall we call them, uh, 
uh, on the interpretation of the resolution 1973 adopted on Libya. Uh, the resolution said that it was uh, there would be a uh, enforcement of a no-fly zone, but that was interpreted by the West to mean that they could actually also use the air force to help the rebel groups against Colonel Gaddafi's regime. Now, this was not according to the East uh, camp uh, discussed in the Security Council, and therefore they felt cheated in the process. And the result was that they felt that no further authorization can be can be given by the Security Council because uh, then things go out of control. You see, uh, authorization of military action is something that's uh, that's now accepted by all permanent five. Uh, as legitimate function of the Security Council, but it does not figure in the security in the Charter itself, because the Charter talks about a UN army, forces to be provided by the members of the UN, primarily the Permanent Five, to the Security Council to be kept under the command of the Security Council. But since that UN army never got set up, because when the Military Staff Com Committee held discussions in 1945-46, there were differences and that uh, the idea of a UN army was shelved. It's come up time and again thereafter, but it's never, never uh, fructified. The result is that uh, in the Korean War as well as in the Iraq War and thereafter, what the Security Council does is it authorizes member states to take in courts all necessary measures to enforce the resolution. Now, uh, this has been interpreted by the Western countries to mean that they can use their force, as they did in the case of Kuwait or in the case of Korea, to send in and launch a military operation. Now, as I said, this has been accepted by the by Russia and China also, but uh, they are uncomfortable with this with this whole idea. So, so the UN army that was planned is quite separate from the UN peacekeeping forces. That's not considered to be part of the UN army that was originally um, envisaged? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, peacekeeping doesn't, the word peacekeeping doesn't figure in the security in the UN Charter. And peacekeeping actually came into its own only in 1960 under Dag Hammarskjöld, because Dag Hammarskjöld realized that uh, in the Congo, when Congo government asked for UN help, uh, he decided to send troops to help the Congo government in maintaining inter internal peace. And he realized that the permanent five would not be acceptable to Congo, which was a newly independent country, because of their colonial uh, background. So he used country, uh, forces from Scandinavian countries, neutral countries like, uh, I think there's Ireland also, Austria certainly, and uh, some countries in Africa, and finally India also stepped in uh, to provide its troops. Now, the idea of a UN army was supposed to be an army of the permanent five, with others contributing. But today in peacekeeping, the permanent five are not present except in very small numbers. And in fact, Dag Hammarskjöld uh, consciously kept the permanent five out. So the peacekeeping forces actually, in, in certain respects, the exact opposite of what the UN army was envisaged to be. China is the only country among the P5 which has a, a large, number, a large major contribution of about 2,800 troops. But the others are in, in their tens, less than 100, I think. Okay, opportunity for any IR fans or experts around the table? Oh, there's plenty of hands going up. Okay, maybe we'll start here, please, and then we'll work down. Thank you. Just a very quick, just a very quick question. Do you think the Security Council will be more effective if more countries were invited to join? As I said, uh, one of the arguments that is used by the uh, countries, the permanent members in particular, is that the Council should not become large because the, the bigger it is, the less effective it will be, the longer time it will take to take decisions, uh, which is a valid point. Any administrator who knows that if you have a big committee, then decision making becomes slower. But at the same time, unless it becomes more representative, uh, its legitimacy is, is in question. And certainly, unless it becomes more democratic, it, its legitimacy will still remain in, in question. But uh, uh, the argument that I made about the other international organizations is that although they, have, uh, they, are, they are open and they have large memberships, uh, 
there is a process of negotiation that takes place among countries the big powers do use their money power they use their influence but nevertheless they still have to exercise that power and security council just sit back and say i can veto so i don't have to go and lobby with smaller countries get their votes which is a good thing in terms of uh, any any democracy knows that that's that's uh, that's a very healthy trend to have that everybody no matter how powerful the leader still has to go back to the people and ask for their vote yes please um i was just wondering you know on the issue of the relevance of um the un and you know the security council etc has there been any effort to kind of redefine what security means today and you know we're still sort of looking and thinking about war uh, being fought on the battleground uh you know there is clearly a geotech war um there are different sort of parameters of war in this day and age and if you know i can certainly see that there's no actual sort of peacekeeping uh, missions that will be launched as a result but certainly there are some tools that can be thought and if there's any sort of cooperation with other international bodies on this front yes um, in fact when you go back to uh, the end of the cold war uh, there were a series of papers prepared under butros butros gali uh, defining security and defining it more in terms of human security and uh, using concepts like human rights being a very important and the whole idea of humanitarian intervention started with the idea that if in a country people are being persecuted or people are suffering because of genocide or uh, other crimes and the government is unable to protect the people then the international community has an obligation to intervene in that now uh, that idea of course is 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 has been challenged but it's been is broadly accepted that if there is a major crime taking place in a country then its international community does owe uh, it to the uh, to the world to intervene uh, the modern problems come from globalization you mentioned about uh, tech areas espionage uh, now these are these are new areas these are not been looked into because after the experience of the humanitarian interventions and the uh, the libya war uh, that idea has not progressed much the idea of responsibility to protect right now r2p as it is called is not has not been pursued since then but these are the areas that one needs to look at because as i said today's globalized world is much too closely integrated for it not to have effective dispute settlement mechanisms and effective mechanisms to enforce those verdicts thank you yes please would you mind just giving your name as well and organization yeah peter de crassel uh, correspondent member based on your experience and uh, remarks here today do you think personally that the un is either relevant today should be restructured or abolished and replaced by a new body well the un is certainly extremely relevant because as i said the un is a huge organization it has at least more than a dozen specialized agencies which keep the wheels of globalization going without them without the icao without the maritime organization the who you won't have globalization uh you have uh, various other organizations that deal with economic and other issues so uh in these areas the un has been quite successful it is essentially in the area of security which is the primary purpose of the un that its success has been uh, rather limited and very modest i wouldn't say completely negligible because there are areas the 14 peacekeeping missions are important they are there in countries uh, keeping the peace uh maintaining the ceasefire which is which is important but the concept of se uh, security uh, or action by the un in the field of security has not grown and the only period when there was an attempt to increase it was in that period of 1992-2011 uh, in that 20 year period when the experience was not very good so everybody kind of backed off from it uh, both the smaller countries that had Uh, some countries in africa wanted responsibility to to protect to be incorporated in the un activities so uh, how we go about it is not going to be easy but uh, it is certainly an area that's important but in today's globalized world you cannot afford to abolish the un simply because it's not able to perform well in security one has to strengthen the security council one has to strengthen and make it more democratic make it more representative kind of more reflective of the Uh, modern democratic constitutions 
one of the things that you realize in security council is the cabinet of any country is responsible to the parliament uh, is regulated by the parliament but the security council doesn't report to the general assembly it in fact there's a complete separation of powers between the two then the icj the international court of justice it doesn't have the power of judicial review of any security council resolution but this was there in the league of nations if a member was aggrieved with a resolution adopted by the council of the league it could appeal to the assembly of the league but in the case of the un because security was so paramount in 1945 the idea that there were two world wars that they felt the security council should have absolute powers there should be no appeal against the decisions and it should have the power to enforce that verdict through the army that was supposed to be given to the Security Council. Okay, uh, do we have a question? Yes, please, down there. Thank you. I'm, I'm uh, Philip uh, Wickery. I teach at our theolog Anglican Theological College across the street. Um, you said that the, the uh, 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 security functions uh, that the UN has is the sanctions and peacekeeping forces. Um, in the Korean War, they also they had another authorization of a police action in, in Korea, which probably passed because the Russians were boycotting the meeting of the Security Council. Are there any other similar uh, UN authorizations on the use of force, or can you foresee this happening, or at least uh, the possibility of it happening again? Well, the authorization to use force was first given in 1950 when North Korea invaded South Korea. This was in June 1950, when the, security, when the Soviet Union was boycotting the Security Council. So the US got a resolution adopted. It initially said that the UN would, uh, that the member states could help South Korea in its right to self-defense. Because right of self-defense is one of the rights given by the UN Charter to all member states. But then later on, it was, it was modified to uh, say that the member states could take action to restore international peace. So that model of action, whereby US forces and forces of certain other member states, there's a coalition formed, uh, moved into South Korea to, to defend South Korea. And uh, these forces called themselves UN force. But it, that was questionable. The Soviet Union questioned the, in fact, this, the Soviet Union came back into the Security Council in August, a month later, and then started blocking any further resolutions uh, on, the, on the Korean War. And they objected to the use of the word UN force for the US forces or the Allied forces that were there in South Korea. Now, thereafter, there was no further authorization of the use of force. Only in 1960, when Dag Hammarskjöld was fa faced the problem of uh, providing peacekeeping forces in Congo, he devised this idea of a peacekeeping force. And uh, peacekeeping forces uh, are approved by the Security Council, but it's unclear under what provision of the UN Charter uh, they are approved. Now, the next authorization for use of military force came in 1990, 1991, when Iraq invaded Kuwait. And there again, the Security Council adopted a similar resolution to the one adopted in 1950, where it authorized member states to take necessary measures to liberate Kuwait. And the US then put together a force, uh, a coalition, what they call the Coalition of the Willing, to then invade uh, Kuwait and uh, liberate the country. Thereafter, authorizations took place in the case of Rwanda, in the case of Somalia, in the case of former Yugoslavia, uh, there were a few more. Libya was the next one. There is Kosovo. There is uh, which else was there? I think I'm missing out on some of them. Uh, yeah, Albania and uh, and the Congo, Haiti also. But when the Libya invasion took place, thereafter the Soviet uh, Russia and China. Uh, refused to allow any further resolutions to be adopted, except two minor ones uh, where French forces intervened in uh, Mali and in, uh, in, the, in, uh, in the Central African Republic. Those were again within 2012, 2013. Thereafter, there's been no further authorization of the use of military force. And as I said, it is very unlikely that in the current environment that would be permitted. Certainly, it wasn't permitted in the case of Yemen and Syria last year. 
those were the last two vetoes that were exercised. Yes, please. Uh, I, George Long, uh, private business here. Um, the, the wording you mentioned um, that the resolutions allow member states to use um, uh, what appropriate means or whatever to um, repel force or whatever. I mean, that seems to be actually one of the problems. I mean, so is there now, do you think there'll be a movement to adopt more precise language that doesn't give um, member states such broad latitude? As I understand it, that's been some of the complaint from other countries that essentially the U.S. has abused that, that broad mandate. So what I could see would be a movement at Security Council Revolution to be much more precise to either say the U.N. has to create a force or uh, it authorizes a specific member state to do a specific act rather than just a very general, such a broad blanket authorization that could be abused. Yes, uh, if you look at the resolutions between 1991 when the Iraq uh, operation was authorized and the ones, uh, let's say in Libya or in the case of Mali or uh, the Central African Republic, there is an evolution in the language and the language becomes a lot more precise. In the case of Libya, for example, uh, there was uh, uh, language of language used. In one of the resolutions, they even described the time limit up to which the action could be taken. Uh, in the case of uh, Mali and Central African Republic, there was a vague reference to a particular country to be able to implement it. So this was, uh, France wasn't mentioned by name, but the idea was that France would be the country that would be allowed to intervene and send its troops. Uh, this was to prevent any other neighboring African country, which might not have been in good terms with these countries, to intervene. So the attempt has been made to make the language more precise, but the biggest problem with these operations has been that once the operation has been authorized, then to stop the operation, you have to have another resolution unless there's a time limit prescribed. And then that resolution can be vetoed. So if one of the permanent five members starts an operation and manages to get a resolution adopted and then continues with that operation and then the other permanent member wants that resolution to be withdrawn, then it has to f contend with the veto of the first uh, permanent member. So uh, the language of the resolution can evolve, but as I said, the degree of trust that prevails today among the permanent five is not enough for them to then now start thinking in terms of negotiating the language and trying to see if language can control the degree of uh, force being exercised. But uh, the idea of a UN army under the command of the Security Council for which there is a military staff committee incidentally. The military staff committee continues to exist. It's mentioned in the charter. It consists of the chiefs of the, uh, uh, the military representatives in the UN of the permanent five members. But they have no role to perform because they don't control or command any of these operations, uh, the authorized military operations. So they meet essentially for lunch every uh, month, every quarter, and they, they exchange pleasantries and go back. So uh, the, the, the idea of a military staff committee controlling a UN army to conduct an operation has not yet uh, taken place in the UN system. Uh, Sarah Monks, a member of the club. Now, President Trump has been quite vocal on what he thinks about the relevance of the, United Na of the United Nations. Do you think he's really targeting the Security Council or the UN system? Or maybe he doesn't know? Or is he, al is he also targeting the entire multilateral system? And do you see this as a kind of one-man passing phenomenon? Or do you think it could be more broadly taken up by other countries as in an era of perhaps greater tribalism, a return to tribalism rather than globalism? Well, that would be very, very tragic, as I said, in, in today's globalized world. It's a globalized world already. Last year, you had 1.2 trillion people traveling across borders. Uh, the amount of money that's invested abroad by people, uh, the amount of trade that is taking place, the number of people dependent upon uh, each other across borders, the number of families, the number of individuals who cannot locate which individual country they belong to. There about uh, Financial Times have done a study once that over 7 or 70 million people have nationalities that cover at least two countries. 
and they can't decide which which one they belong to. They belong to at least two countries. That is, that's a this huge population that that cannot uh, say that you, the borders become final, and I'll be confined to only one country. So in in this kind of a world, it would be extremely dangerous to. Uh, undermine international organizations we have to continue to strengthen them and make them as i said more democratic now the u.s approach to the u.n has the u.s foreign policy itself has been rotating between isolationism which was the original monroe doctrine and the, the newer doctrines that came in the truman uh, doctrine of protecting the world for democracy so th that's this always been every, every country's foreign policy has that but the u.s foreign policy since it's very important it's a very important country uh, that has impacted the u.n much more it is not a trump phenomenon because even earlier presidents have been critical of the u.n and they have withheld their contribution to the u.n that's been an ongoing problem butros ghali's uh, problem came up with the u.s he couldn't get a second term because uh, after he devised this whole idea of humanitarian intervention the u.s kind of developed cold feet so uh, then he, he just couldn't uh, get a second term. So, uh, but in the case of uh, President Trump, I think his primary problem is with trade rather than with the security factor. In the Security Council, in any case, the permanent five are protected by the veto. You know, the veto was devised as, as a security mechanism. Uh, it's difficult to understand today that in, in, it was, it, the idea was, uh, and the idea came from President Roosevelt, that uh, the five policemen he called them the policemen he called used the term four policemen at that time because china wasn't yet part of that no france wasn't a part of that idea that he had initially uh, that these were the policemen of the world and they would together provide security to the world against people like hitler rising and threatening global security so the idea was that if the major powers don't stick together they in any case cannot provide security to the world so all actions must be taken unanimously by the permanent five and they must work together to provide peace to the world. And in fact, in the, in the UN negotiations in San Francisco, there was a talk once that what happens if uh, there's a dispute between the major powers? And then it was the British delegate who said that, well, if there is a dispute between the major powers, then there'll be a war and the UN can't do anything anyway, which is true. I mean, the UN essentially is, a, is an organization of the members. It's not a, it's not a supranational government. Uh, so it will have to depend upon the larger members, the bigger members, to provide it the necessary force to enforce its decisions. So you have the dilemma in the UN of, uh, of the veto and the power of the big powers, that without it, nothing is possible. And at the same time, if you legitimize their power, then it becomes undemocratic in its spirit. Well, perhaps I'll just ask a closing question then, Ambassador Sina. Um, is there a role for the, uh, just getting back to your own experience, is there a role for the Security Council in the India-Pakistan um, conflict? And would it be accepted by both countries if the Security Council was to play a role there? Well, uh, the Security Council has a role in the sense already that you have uh, one of the first uh, peacekeeping missions is the UN uh, Military Observer Group in India and Pakistan. They are still present there in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, both in India and Pakistan. So about 115 uh, peacekeepers are present there. These are military observers. In fact, the two oldest, uh, one is the one in Palestine uh, and the one in India. And these are the only two ones which are paid for by the regular budget of the UN because they were envisaged before. Peacekeeping itself was extremely disputed, incidentally. When the Congo operation was, was launched, France and the Soviet Union questioned the legitimacy of peacekeeping and the matter had to be taken up to the International Court of Justice and uh, at that time it was said look it's not we won't take money from the regular budget we'll take money from uh, trust funds and from uh, extra budgetary contributions so uh, the uh, idea that uh, the, the India Pakistan dispute said this UN has a role and it has a uh, peacekeeping uh, force over there but military observers not peacekeeping force as such uh, and the ceasefire, um, the line of control also has been, but the line of control, the, there was an earlier ceasefire enforced by the UN in 1949. But in 1972, India and Pakistan agreed to convert the line of control into into the ceasefire line to line of control and to resolve the matter bilaterally. India's position is that uh, the Security Council resolutions earlier no longer are applicable because the, they were not implemented. Pakistan's view, of course, is different. 
and Pakistan feels the Security Council still has a role. India feels that it can be dissolved bilaterally. Okay, well, on that note, it's probably one of the more interesting IR talks and certainly the most interesting discussion on the UN I've heard here for some time. So, Ambassador, thank you very much, and please all welcome to the best.